Greg for everyone at Pratt for putting this together. They also were very generous to help Tim fly all the way over from uh, East London to do this. So we should all give him a round of applause later after the event. Or now. <laughs> Um, so I'll just do a quick uh, introduction of Tim's bio, and then I guess we'll get started. Um, and then from there, uh, if I'm correct, Rick will be moderating the event, and then from there we'll have uh, uh, some time for Q&A. Um, I don't know, sure. we'll see how it goes. But, um, sure, it so Tim Hall is a senior lecturer in politics at the University of East London. His main areas of interest are Marxism and Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. His publications include The Modern State, Theories and Ideologies, with Eric Cudworth and John McGovern and the fundamental dissonance of existence um, with Timothy Buse. He's currently writing a book on the political thought of Theodore Adorno. In addition, he has interest in state theory and national ethics, and is currently researching Marxist state theory and cosmopolitan political theory. And as you all know, he'll be talking about Lukash today for his presentation, so give a round of applause for Tim. to speak at the panel over the weekend on Lukash. And thanks also for arranging the weather. <laughs> I feel very much at home here. <laughs> my, my wet feet helped me get around. Um, so, I am indeed talking about Lukash today. The title of uh, the talk I'm going to give is uh, Justice and the Good Life in Lukash's History of Class Consciousness. And uh, essentially it's, uh, I'm just basically talking to a chapter that, uh, that I wrote in this book that uh, Chris mentioned, uh, which is a compilation of essays on, uh, on, on Lukash. Uh, it's co-edited by myself and, and Tim Hughes. Um, and in the chapter, what I'm primarily doing is contesting the charge of, of obsolescence that has Certainly, Bill Lukash, since I've been working on it, uh, I've been trying to kind of rethink that since coming in. There's so many copies of Lukash and of, of history and class consciousness knocking around the place. I'm not sure that runs anymore. Uh, but certainly in, you know, in, in, in the UK, there's very little work on, on Lukash being done. And the, the, the received reading is that he's a dead dog. Um, so, inevitably, I'm writing against that. And my claim that the talk today is um, that there's something uh, important and central about Lukács' concept of critical social theory uh, that can continue to inform critical theory, critical practice today. Uh, and for me, that's seeing Lukács' critical social theory as responding to a twofold problem. Uh, on the one hand, social justice, uh, the notion that modern institutions, modern social relations produce unjust social outcomes, uh, in, in that sense, no surprises. Uh, but the other problem that I see Lukács engaging with, particularly in this you know, early period, around history and class consciousness, there's a problem of the deficit of meaning or nullity. Um, that's to say that you know, the problem isn't just that existing social relations uh, produce unjust social outcomes, but also that they don't mean anything, in a sense, that there's a deficit of meaning. Um, and that I find absent deal of political theory practice today, obviously the Harlemasian paradigm, but also Axel Honig too. But this problem, this twofold problem tends to drop out. So what I'm calling uh, what I'm calling the question of the good life in this paper is the uh, response to this uh, rationalization. It's the problem of life as a whole, as it occurs in history and class consciousness. Consideration of life as a whole rather than one or any particular 
very simple aspect of it. Um, and uh, you know, I see this as a you know powerful and continually interesting aspect of Lukács's argument. This twofold structure of Lukács's critical theory demarcates it from contemporary versions uh, that regrettably increasingly view critical theory as a branch of moral theory uh, in some sense. So what, I, what I'm going to do is kind of dip into a really little bit um, from the chapter and uh, talk from it in talk to it at certain points. So, what's most distinctive about uh, a theory is often what is most contested. This is particularly the case, I would think, I would suggest, in the case of Lukács' essay, Revocation and the Consciousness of the Proletariat, whose generalization of Marx's theory of commodity fetishism is frequently singled out as his most significant contribution to both the Marxist tradition and social theory more broadly. Within the Marxist tradition, Lukács' work responds to what represents the founding document of Hegelian and Western Marxism. And as such, it rids Marxism of its reductive and positivistic and deterministic elements. Beyond this tradition, it represents the tantalizing bridge between two distinct schools of sociological theory, between a class-based analysis of society deriving from Marx and a value pluralistic or perspectival approach deriving from Max Weber. The exact manner of Lukács' generalization of the commodity form, however, is often not, not understood or is written off as confused um, in some sense. Even Axel Honneth detailed and in many ways admirable reading of the essay in the Tavern Lectures appears to pull up short of this generalization, dismissing Lukács' social theory as fundamentally ambiguous, torn between a Marxist functionalist explanation of social illusion on the one hand and a Weberian account of inexorable rationalization on the other. To show the shortcomings of uh, Hollitt's reading, we need to look in detail at uh, Lukács' review of Marx's analysis of the commodity in order to reconstruct his argument. Not, not too much detail, but, uh, but, but, but enough. So, to, to, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, but to, 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 you know, to remind you here, the elaboration of the subject-object forms of bourgeois society begins with a commentary on Marx's analysis of the commodity and proceeds to an outline of subject-object relations, of the subject-object relation constituting the economic aspect of social existence. <coughs> Lukács, as you know, cites Marx's famous passage from Capital One, Chapter One, in which the mysterious character of the commodity form is addressed. What interests Lukács in this analysis is the way that man's own activity our own activity, his own labor becomes something objective and independent of him. This has, he says, both an objective and a subjective significance. Objectively, the world of commodities comes into existence, I'm paraphrasing here, operating in accordance with its own autonomous laws. Subjectively, individuals are alienated from their own distinctively human activity, notionally in this part of the argument, labor which now appears to them as a commodity, like everything else. Lukács goes on to generalize this subject-object relation after distinguishing between the objective and subjective sides of the productive process in which human beings, man, is, uh, is increasingly incorporated into a mechanical system. Uh, he proceeds to an analysis of another of, of after, after doing this, it proceeds to analysis of another, sorry, of, of other subject-object relations obtaining in bourgeois society, in the legal, the political, and cultural spheres. In each case, the rationalization 
of a determinate sphere of human activity is premised upon a similar process of integration into mechanically, mechanically functioning social systems. So, for example, in the context of the emergence of the centralized bureaucratic state, Cash argues as follows. The split between the worker's labor power and his personality, its metamorphosis into a thing, an object that he sells on the market, is repeated here in bureaucratic consciousness too. But with the difference that not every mental faculty is suppressed by the mechanization. Only one faculty, or complex of faculties, is detached from the whole personality and placed in opposition to it, becoming a thing, a commodity. But the basic phenomenon remains the same, even though the means by which society instills such abilities and their material and moral exchange value are fundamentally different from labor power. But what I see going on here is, um, in, in terms of thinking about the generalization of the commodity form, is the subjective side of the process of the formation of the uh, a centralized administrative state. That's to say, alienated bureaucratic labor being, if you like, um, incorporated in state structures. What is striking in this passage is first how the characteristic process of alienation, the splitting off of one aspect of the personality and the opposing of this to the total personality, is not restricted to the experience of industrial labor, but extends into clerical work as well. Secondly, and centrally, for our own focus uh, on Lukács' generalization of the commodity form, the integration of quantitatively measurable human activity becomes the precondition for the rationalization of the administrative sphere or state, just as it did the rationalization of the labor process. The same argument is utilized by Lukács in accounting for the emergence of a rational system of law. So, economic sphere, political sphere, legal sphere, and the reification of the public sphere, or cultural sphere. Just as the human qualities and idiosyncrasies of the worker become in the context of the rationalized labor process a mere source of effort, so in the administrative and legal spheres, Individual judgment and discretion are increasingly foreclosed on the grounds that they upset the otherwise predictable outcomes of mechanically functioning social systems. Lukács contrasts modern and pre modern systems of law not because he favours a return to the latter, but to highlight the extent to which, judge, to which judgment and the exercise of discretion are precluded by the advent of the forum. Rationalized social systems are mechanical precisely because they leave no room or provide no objective basis for free, self-originating action. We all know this as academic administration, there's room for increasingly little room for exercise discretion or judgment. In a sense. Uh, every action follows from an antecedent cause and freedom itself is produced to a subjective vantage point from which to observe and then judge the inexorable course of social events. The case is similar, I think, in the rationalization of the public sphere. Just as the seamless integration of the laborer or the bureaucrat is the precondition of the thoroughgoing rationalization of labor, administration and the legal, legal process, so the self-commodification of the journalist is the precondition for the emergence of what Adorno and Horkheimer will later call the administered public sphere. For Lukács, journalism represents the apogee of the capacity for self reification inasmuch as the very intuitions, personality and temperament of the journalist are commodified. In this respect, I think that Hollitz's recent study is, uh, you know, is quite, quite interesting when it's talking about, um, it, it homes in on this particular quote here, thinking about our capacity for self-commodification and uh, links to emotional labor today, studies in the sociology of work. 
Um, what, so what appears so, um, what appears irreducible human characteristics, which as such, def as such defy all attempts at commodification, turn out to be all too commodifiable in journalism, and the basis for a thoroughgoing rationalization of the cultural sphere. And rationalization of the cultural sphere is precisely what Adorno and Horkheimer elaborate in the dialectic of the they're talking about those famous passages from uh, the cultural industry section talking about um, uh, actors and uh, you know, fitting into very, very, very definite objective types, as it were. Um, you know, I think this is continuous, really, with Lukács' analysis here of journalism. And moreover, the understandable concern to update Lukács' analysis, replacing it with ever more refined and complex accounts of cultural industries, each with their own logic, runs the risk of overlooking this basic insight that the commodity form provides the basis for thinking the subject-object relations of bourgeois society in their entirety. The ramifications of this generalization, with its characteristic constitution and objective and subjective domains, are profound and, in my view, have not been fully appreciated, uh, particularly in the Marxist tradition. It also goes to the heart of Lukács' celebrated synthesis of the social theories, theories of art and labor. I'll say a little bit about that now, just because Honnett seems so flummoxed in his uh, in his study uh, of, of, of reification. In relation to Marx, first of all, Lukács extends Marx's argument about the alienated social activity that appears as an objective characteristic of a thing its value in exchange or price to the legal, political, or cultural spheres, sorry, and cultural spheres. Marxists are familiar with the notion of domin the domination of use value by exchange value in the commodity form is premised on the suppression of concrete use value generating labor by abstract measurement of social labor. This makes possible the notion of alienated social labor inherent in the commodity form. As a consequence, it becomes possible to think an alternative to the distributive productive decisions that follow the fluctuations of the values of commodities in the market. Instead of these, production could be socialized, such decisions could be the outcome of a process of deliberate planning, etc. The effect would be that fluctuations in value, that fluctuations in value is no longer experienced as a quasi-natural force that determines how resources are distributed and what and how much is produced in society. Lukács' great innovation, on my reading at least, is the notion that social activity, not simply labour, is alienated in other aspects of the social structure. This is precisely what Lukács intends with the generalisation of the commodity the emergence of the modern state, the centralized bureaucracy, the emergence of a rational system of law, and even the emergence of a system of culture are all predicated on the seamless integration of social activity into mechanical, mechanically functioning systems. And here I think, I mean, this is a kind of key point, I'm not sure, in, in, in my interpretation of Lukács, and it's social activity comes to be incorporated into uh, abstractly functioning social systems. Uh, not labor, not labor, not just labor in this way. Um, and I, this is why I, you know, why I, 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 I take issue with Postone's interpretation of Lukács, because, I mean, this is precisely where Postone comes in, with Lukács, the problem with Lukács, the reason in which is social theory remains classical is because labor is assumed to be historically invariant. Um, and you know what 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 the stone wants and what possibly rightly wants is a kind of historicized understanding of labor. Yeah. Um, but I think that Postone goes off in you know completely the wrong direction uh, when I mean, it's, you know, it's a great book and 
you know, hugely thoughtful in all sorts, of, hugely productive in all sorts of ways. But um, you know, this reading or this kind of original critique of Hegelian Marxism, what, what that does is you know, rethink or re um, um, represent the Hegelian Marxist problematic as a relation between the logic and capital. Um, so where Lukács goes wrong is it supposes that there is something, there is such a thing as a meta theory, you know, as a meta historical subject, the proletariat, um, that overcomes um, the alienated form of the social labor. And then recovers its subjectivity, its political subjectivity uh, in the world. There's no such thing as that subject according to the stone. Um, what, you know, if there is such a thing as the subject of history, it's an unconscious one and it's capital. Um, so, in this way, the you know, stone you know, tracks uh, a part of the behavior, um, the idea of the the self-moving substance, which is subject, which is capital. So what Hegel is going around for you, the logic is giving a, um, a, 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 a ready to handle or approximate account of the logic of capital, which is then um, fulfilled by Marx or indeed by Marx. I think this is hugely problematic because it leaves you without any way of thinking class. There's no basis for thinking class. But that doesn't mean that one uh, necessarily is, is going to hallucinate a political subject which is not there. But what it, you know, I mean, you've got to have some kind of class domination. So I'm going to put a good door down this uh, in, in, in his analysis. So, Late, late capitalism gives you class domination without the possibility of class consciousness. So this is crucial. This goes back, this argument itself goes back to a proposal by Gillian Rose back in 84 that we should think about we should think about the relation between the productivity of spirit and the productivity of labor. This is a paper conscious sociology. Um, that that's the you know that's the knock to thinking about the relation between Marx and Hegel. What what is the difference between the productivity of labor and the productivity of spirit understood as our um, social historical work? That's what it was a metaphysical category. And that's what I you know, that's what I'm so when I'm talking about social activity in general coming to be incorporated into Abstractly functioning social systems. Yeah. Uh, that's what, what I'm thinking about in terms of, in terms of the Marx Hegel relation. And I'm with Lukács, rather than with Um So, if the same fundamental tendency is at work in the productive, legal, administrative, and cultural processes, then there's no need to theorize social structure in terms of base and superstructure the former having ontological primacy over the latter. What is fundamental is not that for man or human beings confronted by nature reproducing its own material conditions of existence in a position of original scarcity, but the process by which in modernity our own activity becomes something, our own social historical activity becomes something independent of us, something that controls us by virtue of an autonomy alien to us. Paraphrasing Lukács again. Here, the fundamental is understood not in pure, is understood in purely historical terms, alluding to the meaning of uh, present, uh, not to speculative philosophy, philosophical anthropology. In other words, the recovery of social activity will not take the form of the reversion to an original nature, as it will do in Lukács's later work, most notably. The young Hegel. Any trace of a philosophical anthropology is conspicuous by its absence in the reification history. Rather, the commodity form, or more specifically, the proletariat as self-conscious commodity, 
is the central cipher of the present, which makes possible an understanding of the subject, object, process, and structure of society as a whole. It is, the, it is the historical present brought to self-awareness for which the model is Hegel, rather than Rousseau. Incidentally, I think Posterum's critique works very well against um, the young Hegel, against the later Lukács, in this way. And I mean, just for some reason, Lukács misreads a very interesting relation between history and class consciousness and the 1844 manuscripts. Just recants his own position, I think. The historical position that he adumbrates in uh, or outlines in his history of class consciousness cannot be reduced to uh, to uh, Marx's position. Interesting in different ways in the 1844 manuscripts. So, in relation to Weber, uh, looking at this, uh, thinking again about this synthesis between Marx and Weber. Lukács makes the integration of human social activity into mechanically functioning social systems the basis of the rationalization of productive, legal, and administrative spheres that Weber traced in the <coughs> economy and society. Lukács thereby challenges Weber's contention, famously as we know, that rationalization is the fate of the West. The possibility that the alienated social activity lying dormant in societal things or institutions could be awoken implies that there is nothing inexorable about rationalization. A further and more significant upshot is that Lukács makes available to a Marxist approach the critique of enlightenment conceptions of reason that Weber inherits from Nietzsche. Of course, Lukács is famously allergic to Nietzsche, but he imbibes a great deal through Weber. Evidently cheer. This is the drive or will advanced in modern rationalism towards rendering human life in all its aspects increasingly predictable and calculable. The, uh, the specter or the, the um, hallucination of a wholly rationalized life. So, whilst making rationalization conditional on the prior alienation of social activity and reified social structures, Lukács also introduces debates around reason and rationality in Marx's thought. Might the form of domination bound up with the suppression of use value in value and exchange actually have its roots in our most fundamental concepts of reason and rationality in the norms and ideals that underpin these conceptions? We're familiar with the idea that we're complicit in social domination insofar as we exercise our economic agency buy, sell, invest, etc., save. And even by extension, our social agency more broadly construed. Voting or suing people, or something like that. <laughs> but does this extend to the activity of expressing our opinions, to concept formation in the sciences, and thinking itself? What is at stake in the problem of commodity for Luca? is not simply the extraction of surplus value, the overthrow of class-based forms of social domination, but the very possibility of a meaningful and worthwhile life. What the ubiquity of the commodity form presages, presages is a thoroughgoing rationalization of life to the point where no aspect of human existence, social, political, cultural, inner or outer, is spared the disintegrating effects of societal purification. So Lukács' generalization of commodity form, instead of, as Honig contends, representing a fundamentally incoherent attempt to marry irreconcilable, class-based, and perspectival approaches in social theory, what it actually does is open up an entirely original analysis, one that we're in danger of losing today, in which the traditional tasks of sociology and philosophy to redeem claims of social justice and to account for the possibility of a good life are interconnected or entwined. On the basis of this extension of the alienation of labour to social activity in general, Lukács invites us to think the ontological primacy attributed to productive labour. Uh, sorry, 
Lukash invites us to rethink the ontological primacy attributed to productive labour in the standard materialist approach. But you can see by the way that I'm interpreting Lukash here that it's a very short walk indeed to things of dialectic and um, the investigation there commodified forms of thought or identity thinking as, uh, as an auto calls it. Uh, and I, I see a huge crossover, I see a huge uh, overlap between Lukács and Adorno. I think Adorno's work in particular is constantly, consistently informed by history of class consciousness. A book which you might disavow, at least not, not what I'm aware of. So how am I doing for time? It's about half an hour or so. Forty? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to, so, so I summarise these two other claims that I make in this essay, and I go on then to look at uh, the, uh, to, 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 to interpret Rukash's concept of praxis as a materialist concept of reason, fundamentally, which um, presupposes or is, is, is derived, if you like, through a meta critique of idealism, um, anthropocentrism. What is, what is praxis for Lukács? Well, uh, it's anthropocentric. Um, it's a version of the primacy of practical reason. Um, it's a search for a concept of form, which is not indifferent to content. And that's just thought through a problematic thing in itself um, in, in, in the metacritical section of the gratification uh, essay, uh, which is aesthetic reason, potentially. It looks at Schiller in the metacritical team, but it could as well be the critique of judgment. Uh, and, and, and finally, through the notion to Hegel's concept of mediation, it's a uh, you know, way of thinking aesthetic reason. Uh, in history. So what is, you know, what are the patterns in history that enable um, that uh, enable self-understanding or enable history to become aware of itself, to become conscious of itself. And the proletariat is nothing other than history become aware of itself, become conscious of itself. Um, and what I, what I try and argue in the middle section is that uh, I, I, I take up the infamous identity claim, uh, which, which again is dismissed by from other bars on. Uh, this is the idea that the proletarians are the identical subject of, 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 of history, uh, which I think both Habermas and Hornet think are derived Indian or Hegelian metaphysics. Um, but what I argue in this central section is that Lukács should be thought really as a, as a philosopher of novelty, <coughs> of, of, um, of, of novelty rather than identity. And I think this can be seen if you look at the way that he writes about the rightful concepts of history in that middle section. Again, the problem of the philosophy of history, bourgeois philosophy of history for Lukács, is that it cannot, it cannot, it cannot think of you. All it can think of are combinatory forms, slipping into pastoriality of language, all it can think of pastor, uh, uh, combinatory forms of what has been in some way. It can't think of you, it can't think, um, um, it, it cannot think the radically new. Um, and, he, and, and even Hegel can't for, for Lukács. I mean, that's the limits of the Hegelian dialectic for, for Lukács, too, that it's cognitive um, and, by its own ambition, backward looking, backward glancing. Um, Hegel's famous claim that the beginning of phenomena, the philosophy of right. Uh, philosophy always comes too late. Well, praxis then, as a um, as anthropocentric, 
as a form of practical reason, as a form of the, as a version of the doctrine of the primacy of the practical and the theoretical and contemplative, uh, as a as involving a non-substantive conception of form, of aesthetic version of form. Uh, and, and this is and as historicized you know, is it is about the capacity to innovate new forms, new political forms, non-rule guided uh, and, and without precedent, as I as I read really Lucas. Yeah. Now I think um, now how far how, how far is that reading sustainable? Yeah. Well, I think there's a limit to it. I think that's the kind of inheritance to be that even go as far as you can in Lukash. Uh, uh, eventually kind of identity starts reasserting itself against uh, ontological novelty. Um, and I, you know, I, I think ultimately it's unsustainable. I see you know, Lukash's project as a radical historicization. It's an attempt to, uh, to, to to radically historicize uh, reason without, of course, ending up with a sociology of knowledge and so like that because it's a form of practical reason. It's an account ultimately of, of how we act. It's a radically historicized position. Possibly in a way what the stone wants, more with insisting on the uh, historicization of, of labor. Um, so, I think I'm going to, I think I might, I think I might stop there. I, mean, I was going to say a little bit more about this notion of the good life, or what I see as the kind of perfectionist elements in, in Lukash. Um, I mean, clearly, that sounds unpromising, and the way that probably the good life occurs in this part of uh, or McIntyre. Uh, it's some essentialist project, you know, whether it's uh, reversion to natural law or um, functions, capabilities uh, in, in, in this part, some, some, some accounts, some non-reductive accounts of what a minimally fulfilled human life involves. Um, I mean, that's not Lukash in any way. I don't think. I mean, that's not compatible in any way. Or radically historicised. I can. But what I'm thinking, and my question really, I haven't got that far with it. Is could this um, radical historicised project, uh, you know, given that they, you know, he insists on these questions, he insists on the question of life as a whole, and the our response to the um, uh, to, to the uh, social instantiation of realism. This stuff doesn't mean anything anymore. When, when one starts engaging in, in, in macrological social thinking, there is that moment. All this stuff doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of Lukashian moment. Um, um, is it, I mean, could one uh, recover uh, a radically historicized uh, project? I mean, could one think of a class politics around uh, a notion of the, of the good life? And I, I'm also an activist, as I should say, in my own And I mean, think it's actually kind of what, what, what I'm doing when I'm involved in things like uh, the living wage campaigns. And the focus there, and I, I see it as a form of class politics, not particularly around the point of production. But the focus there is the good life, the good. And that's under theorized, and obviously, uh, at a practical level, it doesn't really need to be theorized that much in order to, to kind of work, to do the work there. But um, uh, so, I mean, what I would like to try and do bring this kind of heavy theoretical framework into, in, into line with thinking about uh, a radical class politics, or class politics, uh, thinking about the notion of the good life.
Okay, so it's not going to be very long. I'll stop there. So thank you. So, yeah, we have a lot of, we have about 45 minutes for, um, for questions and stuff, so if you want to. Yeah, I want to follow up on that, especially in terms of potential relationship to practical politics. Um, this notion of the good life, I'm wondering, I hope this is not reductionist, uh, in the way that it posits the possibility of a good life, is, is it a historical possibility of a modernity, where it's opposing itself in relationship to, you know, the opening up of potential emancipated society after 1917, uh, if it's talking about the emancipated subject beyond, you know, what modernity and capitalism had offered, if it had some sort of, is it possibly itself possible within modernity or something after it? Well, I mean, it, 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 it's clearly, I mean, it's, it's given that it's going to be brought into line with the notion of praxis, of ontological novelty, of creating the important forms. You can't specify it in some essentialist way. Uh, so you're not going to be able to do as Aristotle does and make an accusations and it's a good reading of it in a way to say, well, you know, here's the recipe of human satisfaction and fulfillment that involves these elements, pleasure, honor, um, virtue, and some support from external goods as well. It's not going to admit at the time of uh, once and for all specification <coughs> in that way. So it's got to be historically revisable. Uh, uh, but that we, we're committed to doing that, um, that um, you know, it, 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 it is built into the, uh, to reversing the disintegrating effects of, 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 of rationalization that life as a whole, the problem of life as a whole, is reposed. Um, it's not something that will be picked up, I think, from the Lukashian perspective. Um, I'm not sure if that's... Well, I'm just wondering big. its relationship yeah. to, you know, revolutionary politics, authoritarian, you know, like authoritarian subject that emerges, and Lukash speaks about the potential for that, to, um, for an overcoming, and, um, historical transformation, right, for a better world. Yeah. Um, that's what I was kind of, what was the relationship between this idea of the good life and the idea that reaching some sort of emancipated society or um, revolutionary politics, like proletarian revolution in 1917 moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, so go. Um, first of all, I, Take to heart and agree with um, the uh, criticism of, of Moshe Pastone's reading of the uh, uh that you enunciate. I wanted to sort of ask something about we talk about um, the difference between uh, labor and human social activity, yeah. right, as categories. Um, and uh, I also wanted to, to sort of raise the question of, of the mechanical, in other words, the, this use of the mechanical as a sort of a model or a metaphor yeah. in Lukács um, as, uh, you know, in a way a kind of descriptive uh, kind of category, like talking about the mechanization of, of the faculties as well as the mechanization of, of social practice. So, um, given that I'm so sympathetic of the criticism of the stone, I wanted to sort of bring up uh, maybe one of the stone's points with respect to how to think of capital. And that's, um, and I want to sort of ask you how, how you thought about the issue of time. In other words, um, the question of, of how time figures um, in, in Lukács' elaboration of Marx and, and sort of elaboration of, kind of theory of reification. Um, because I, I tend to think that the Poisson doesn't see an adequate account of time in Lukács, and that's why Poisson has to, in a sense, reject Lukács because Poisson emphasizes so much in his own interpretation of Marx the primacy of the category of time, and the, in a sense, the historical specificity of the form of time. And so I just wanted to sort of hear what you what you have you know found in your own reading of Lukács with respect to that. He certainly talks about time, doesn't he? And the famous Bucanetti uh, described Lukács as 
bring in Bergson into the <laughs> factory or something. Uh, I've, never, I've never really followed that up. I mean, there are those sections when he's talking about the rationalization of the labor process. He's you know, talking about the quantitative changes of time. Uh, but I've never really followed that up. Personally, you know, myself. I, mean, I, I take a kind of Kantian line on this, which is to say that there is a kind of minimal object awareness for which you can't extrapolate. Time. So I mean that kind of you know, but the the there. Right. time is thematized specifically. Well, Heidegger Heidegger responds, can, no, you know, with Kant. Well, yeah. Heidegger responds to Lukács too, yeah. in a sense. Or at least according to Lucien, yeah. right? There's a kind of the the um Heidegger didn't know her. <laughs> didn't know the person. Like Lucien and Goldman you know, the thought the new so yeah, so that there was some yeah. Yeah. Because they think about the issue of like legal I didn't read the legal predictability <laughs> and, and bureaucratic rationality, yes. and even the notion of a cultural system yeah. in the Horkheimer Adorno sense of like culture industry. Um, like if you look at um, the orphaned chapter from Dialogue of Enlightenment to Schema of Mass Culture, yeah. that's in the Adorno with the uh, the J. Bernstein edited yeah. culture industry book. Adorno makes this a big point yeah. that the that sort of, you know, Schema, yeah, yeah that, that sort of Schoenberg and Brecht and yeah. jazz and uh, film all have a kind of yeah. core temporal kind of dynamic that links yeah. them. Um, and, you know, so, you know, it seemed that, I mean, again, I'm just sort of asking in terms of your own thinking, um, you know, how that might be pursued. Or even like, if, if yeah. how do you interpret the quality remark that it's um, bringing no, the person into the fact? Just as a, a refusal, really. And I think it's a kind of throwaway comment in a certain sense. That's a rejection. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I mean, I think, I mean, in a certain way, Adorno's the big account of, isn't he? And, uh, um, you know, there's a, there's a, I mean, talking about the cultural industry is function as, 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 as a form of the work of the transcendental schema, I mean, even for your reason. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's precisely that, isn't it? The schema document it shows the kind of complete integration um, of, of, um, of, 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 of individual, even their like, cultural activity into a kind of self functioning autonomous system uh, that is causal. Only understood in terms of cause and effect. Cause and effect. Um, I don't, you know, I think it'd be very interesting. I think actually, uh, I think it would be interesting to read the history of class consciousness again with, um, with Heidegger, particularly part two, in the ecstasies of time. Uh, because clearly, Lukács is thinking about the present. And I know, for me, I mean, that does involve a kind of collapsing of past and future in a certain way. Uh, there. There's a certain kind of transfigurative moment there, which would resonate with Heidegger, I think. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with kind of thematizing time as a delegate's so kind of Kantian position there. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I think, you know, I don't have, I think it's a very, very interesting question. It would be very, very interesting to, to explore that. See if there's more, more could be said. And I agree that uh, that um, Goldman, you know, I've never really got too much from that, from that reading. And Sartre remarked in Search for a Metric that um, Lukács has never read Heidegger, and even though he has the wherewithal to do so. Lukács never Sartre, Sartre yeah. uh, mentions this, that Lukács will not approach Heidegger, yeah. and, although he has the wherewithal. He, he mentions this in the Search for a Metric, the introduction yes. of the critique of dialect. Yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe just thought it's one of his commentators. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about, you use the term of the thoroughgoing rationalization of life um, a number of times, and I wonder, I mean, I wonder if, if it's a little too one-sided a description of rationalization, because in some ways, like, on the one hand, in Lukács, I mean, because on the one hand, it is a thoroughgoing rationalization of every sphere of activity, but on the other hand, it seems to me part of the, the emphasis is then, but it's actually not a rationalization at all, because the, the biggest rational question, does my life as a whole, does, 
all of human history as a whole, etc., does it have a meaning, a purpose, a goal, an end, etc., is not a question you can even sort of pose anymore through the tools of reason. You can talk about, you know, does the factory, you know, in, in my work in the bureaucracy, do I get X goal done? But the sort of, the issue of the good life, like, am I as a person, have I had a complete life? Have I as a person been, become a person? Like, that's not even a question that can be asked anymore. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, it's it's both the, the complete rationalization but the non-rationalization. I mean, this is back to the sort of Weber, you know, we, we have the complete rationalization of everything, but actually this sphere of value, the what is life for, the, the Tolstoy question in Weber, yeah. you, you can't talk about it anymore. It's just, it's meaningless. Like, all you can do is sort of make a decision, et cetera. And, and it seems to me that what Lukács is trying to say is that both conditions are part of the same problem. Like, it's, it's not that the, um, that for Weber, you know, there's sort of rationalization on this side, there's irrationality, and sort of the advance of rational, rationality automatically makes for this total, complete separation. It's for Lukács, a particular kind of rationality, say, modern rationality, is one that produces these two things. But you might imagine some sort of other form of rationality that doesn't hive into these absolutely two spheres where... For reason. Yeah. For reason. That's right. Well, of course, that's exactly what I'm arguing. You know, we need a concept of reason. Uh, I, I, you know, I think the question is deeply influenced by, by Weber and the, and the most classic statement of this, mm -hmm. of the thoroughgoing rationalization of life is uh, a mm -hmm. work ethic book there, um, I, I know, and I, 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 you know, I just see Lukács' project as fundamentally taking off uh, from there, or departing from there. Um, well, maybe it's not right to think that this is the basis for thinking again, a question on thinking about the good life, or life as a whole. But uh, the postcode has got no basis for it, because you know, we train our critical minds on totality. <laughs> um, and you know, however, how dare you think you should have a meaningful <laughs> life? However, totality functions normatively in praxis um, for Lukash, um, not as a regulative idea, um, but um, you know, as in some way, kind of a kind of reflective way of thinking what it is to be governed by. <coughs> In a way, and perhaps in the way that like Robert Pippin has read, read Hegel, and then the phenomenology of reason there. There's a you know, kind of excavation of thinking about what it is to be governed by a norm, uh, which is not in terms of Kantian categories, um, but also with novelty in a sense. Um, is, But I agree, it's a recovery of the concept of reason and rationality. Uh, I want to sort of respond to the prospect of politics that you ended with. Um, so for Lukács, at the end of the theory of the novel and sort of the pre-history and class consciousness writings, it seems like the only way for redemption would be sort of, sort of like a future event whose contours are unclear and like he sees it in Dostoevsky and it's like it's it's hazy and it, it's catastrophic in a way but that tone changes in history and class consciousness if the problem is still there but it becomes a problem that is actually if not resolvable then it becomes the prospect of his resolution is opened and the reason he saw that was because of the Russian Revolution which is the rise of radical Marxism and radical Marxism is something that could deliver maybe not deliver, actually redeem is probably the right word, redeem and transform the rationality emergent in capital. However, and, and Western Marxism then is to sort of in some sense a way to keep open that, that hope or that, like, that vision in philosophical form after the moment for its politics have passed. So it seems that to translate that, this back into politics uh, actually risks losing the critical edge of these concepts. By saying, look, living wage should do this, but living wage ultimately I don't think could convince you that it's going to open up the question of a good life, however worthwhile it should be. I mean, this is not an argument against living wages or, you know, freedom from want or necessity. It's to say that the politics 
of living wage campaigns, of contemporary activism, cannot deliver this sort of hope. And actually, we sort of, in some ways, are in a moment that's, uh, it's not fair to say it's closer to Nietzsche or Weber, but actually that our horizon of despair is, should we, we should be honest about that, right? And not sort of jump into false forms of positivity. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> guaranteed income next time, not yes. working wage. Oh, yeah, guaranteed income, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I don't want to make too much of, of, uh, of, 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 of the, I don't have any answers to, to, to this. I'm, I'm, I, I would, a, a politics without a class, I can't envisage. And yet, obviously, that's no longer classically about organising around the workplace. So, you know, personally, I, I'm interested in the idea of zonal organising. And, uh, you know, I like kind of like the, um, the, the notion of the good of life sitting there, mm. because it does some of that work, you know, even though you know, when, it's, when it's theorized, it's down, it's, it's, not, it's not good. <laughs> um, what do you mean by zone? By what? Zone? Zone, I, I just mean, I mean, you know, the campaigns I've been involved in, you know, the target the city of London, so, that's yeah. that. so we would, you know, be a trade union, uh, it would be a citizens' organisation, uh, it would be in schools, universities. It's a geographical uh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm not <coughs> um, and it's, it's Politically, it's interesting, but fraught, of course, you know, because you've got, you know, in London, you've got kind of churches, trade unionists, <laughs> kind of, uh, they're doing politics together, and that kind of falls apart frequently. Uh, it's interesting. This question of the relationship of obviously labor politics in a critical theory is, I think, very important. I, I mean, one thing that uh, leads off of uh, your comment about the transition from theory of the novel and, and strength class consciousness is that it's not as if during the writing of, of, of theory of the novel there were no what in comparison to today we would call like radical class politics. Um, in fact, it was the high part, uh, the high point of like working class politics. Um, but Lukács, it, for some reason, it didn't resonate with Lukács. Um, it didn't, didn't resonate. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. concerning himself Marxist, you know, he was yeah. particularly interested in you know joining that political movement. And I mean, it seems to me that much of history and class consciousness is is trying to make good on. Uh, in fact, the, the radical criticism um, of class politics as practiced by you know, what he calls, of course, the vulgar Marxists, yeah. um, but also the very possibility that he finds imminent in Marx um, that uh, class politics itself is, is a part of capitalism, um, that the very rationality, the very bureaucratic form, state forms are just sort of like a, a march of, of state Western reason uh, into institutional form, uh, but rather provoked uh, and brought into being. Uh, by a large, like mass working class movements uh, that nevertheless fall short of, of their own emancipatory potential. Um, so I, I wanted to know how you saw uh, this problem, what say Marx identified as uh, the general law of, of capitalism, not, not necessarily as kind of an object, objectivistic law, but rather as a normative uh, kind of uh, structure uh, in which the working class it, itself constitutes its own domination. Uh, as being related to your uh, the problem you've identified as uh, the problem of the good life or, or nihilism under capitalism, like what Heider called the age of constant meaninglessness. I yes. mean, whether or not a kind of normative approach um, to politics is, is in fact like what uh, Marx and Lukács are really driving at, uh, and not trying to in fact abolish what what is the normative structure of society, a structure that is that is uh, uh, law driven and, and, and thereby unfree. Well, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, as you know from this in class consciousness, I mean, Lukács is right there in terms of the point of production. I mean, how are commodity relations to be overthrown? Well, through a particular position on the worker. Uh, that, that, it's, a, it's a privileged standpoint in the sense that they are, you know, as workers, we are capable of seeing through the commodity. Okay? We are commodities capable of becoming conscious of itself as such, as thinking objects in that way. Uh, 
So there's no question that Lee Crash thinks that you know, uh, the formation of proletariat as a part is a point of rupture. You know, it's a potential point of rupture. But there's also, there's also this great strain of central European realism running through. <laughs> Uh, as, I, you know, as I see it running through his, his, his work. And um, Neil Larson has done some good stuff on this as well, just thinking about Lukács' thinking around crisis. I mean, there, there is that um, uh, uh, Lukácsian moment, isn't there, in Lukács, where they're sitting around <laughs> anticipating the, the Black Death, as it were, or anticipating some play. There is, it's a catastrophe, it's a crisis, capitalism is catastrophic. And of course, you know, contra second international crisis, there's, there's no reason why we're not going to end up there. Complete, absolute sympathy, or catastrophe. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, you... But the proletariat has, you know, I mean, on my reading at least, they're, 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 they're overloaded in a way, but they've got two roles. Not only to you know, redeem the claim of social justice, but to render the world meaningful. But, but I'm thinking <laughs> so, of an yeah. ultra many means a thesis on the philosophy of history, where he said that the social democrats' greatest crime was of simply projecting a, a kind of better future for the workers, yeah. like an increasingly better piece of the pie, yeah. um, rather than the memory of, of, of their uh, uh, crumbling <laughs> ancestors. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that what he's driving at here is, is that. One of the things that characterized uh, the Social Democratic parties, um, uh, uh, and this is what Rosa Luxemburg, uh, uh, among others, uh, criticized very sharply, was the idea that, say, simply democratizing capitalism, so kind of buying our way in through trade unions, um, through parliamentary parties, um, that all of that like, misses the point, in some sense, that the deep point of, of capitalism. That, that Marxism, that, that critical theory, like isn't something that's like, comfortable, you know, that will like on that just gonna happen because like, everyone will just kind of recognize it's a good thing. Uh, it's something almost terrifying. Um, it, it's, it's literally bringing an entirely new world into being, achieving maturity, um, such, such that you know, Marxism or critical theory can't be kind of reduced to the question of, of like uh, something that everybody would just agree with, you know, because it's like would make them happy uh, or something. In some sense. In order to make change, people have to recognize the costs, not only of, of um, not acting, but the potential costs and risks of acting. Well, typically, there's loads of risk in Luke, yeah. in the sense. I mean, there's a risk in the collective identity. Praxis consists in, I mean, there's no blueprint in any way for, for, for what's to follow. And that's certainly there in my reading of Luke, it's creation, it's ad liner, and it has to regard it. New structures, new institutions, new political forms, without you know without anything to fall back on, without any guidance. And so it's risk and sense. Uh, completely. Um, this is something that you kind of touched upon, but why is it that you feel like at the end of your paper you need to make a distinction between? Class, class politics around um, the notion of the good life and like just the political project of Marxism. Why do I feel the need to make that well, distinction? Well, yeah, it's, or yeah. are you not making that distinction? Uh, well, yes, I am. I mean, I, I, I say the question of good life arises in Lukács um, just through the, the problematic of the social consequences of it is of, of meaningless uh, social life uh, in which we're, we're not adequate to the world in terms of uh, acting on it as a separation of like, two subjective will, a mediated subjective will, an objective causal order. Um, and that, that thought as well as through individuality as well through individual life, although Lukács doesn't talk a great deal about that, but a similar argument could be made there. Uh, you know, I just, as, as a way, I think, of, um, of, of emphasizing this other dimension to Lukács' social thought. I mean, it, it, I'm dismayed by the sole focus on social justice. Um, as if that's enough, um, 
the sole focus of social justice. Do you, you feel like theory. Marxism it has a sole focus on social justice? Um, that's a big claim, right? I mean, it depends which Marxism, in a way. Um, but I, I would say critical theory generally, um, too often, just becomes wholly exclusively focused on social justice. And this, yeah, this issue of you know, the meaninglessness of social life. I guess I'm just trying to get back to the question that Laurie yeah. asked originally at the beginning about, and actually like what Greg was talking about yeah. too, just um, the Marxism of like, I don't know, like the Second International, uh, Second International Radicals. Like, it's not just that it, it wasn't just a, a focus on social justice, but it was actually about attempting to create like. Cool. Yeah. Society. Yeah. And that would be like the project of all Marxism, I guess. That's what you're making the argument that there's several different Marxisms, and you're kind of yeah. against the one that's all about like overcoming oppression and yeah. social justice. Well, Marco's, Marco's talk at the weekend was very, you know, it was interesting in this respect because he's really Lukash very much through Lenin, through Lenin's politics in that way. I'm just not sure, there's not a great reader of Lenin. I'm, I'm not, Convinced of that is, of course, as a philosopher, maybe. But I mean, whether it could sustain the kind of um, the kind of way that Lukash wants to put on it, certainly in that Lenin book, I'm doubtful of that. Mm. Um, about the project of uh, providing a materialist concept of reason, about the necessity, which carries over in the of all kind of, of providing a materialist concept of reason. I'm not convinced that that can be squeezed into the Lenin's program. We're going to disagree with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm yeah. talking. Yeah. Um, okay. um, try to fill in for me a little bit. What still feels to me to be a, a leap from the um, what everybody seems to agree is the nihilistic strain derived through Weber from Nietzsche in Lukács. Um, which, if that's the derivation of you want to give, there are multiple derivations possible, but that seems to me the right one for, for Lukács. The, the diagnostic consequence of that seems to be a deficit meaning. Yes. How do you get from the deficit of meaning to the concept of this, this, this seems to me to be a, yeah. a leap that I, I can't even trace the beginnings of it yes. in your analysis. And, and, and let me say why I was surprised yeah. you made this move. You, you made a gesture before you began the, um, the presentation proper against what you feel will happen, is happening to the theory, that is becoming the branch of moral theory. Yeah. Yet it seems to me what you're calling for at the end of the paper is a kind of supplementation of a largely Kantian project of critical yeah. moral theory with an Aristotelian or a perfectionist moment. Yes. But that's not going to save from a kind of um, um, commitment grounded, it seems to me, barely in Lukács to a particular moral conception of the good life. It seems ungrounded in the diagnosis you're offering, which I probably agree with it for the sake of argument and willing to grant yeah. entirely. Why the good life? But another concept that was floated that you, in the discussion, you might have reached for it didn't, yeah. was the concept of emancipation, which does seem at least rooted in the, um, the, 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 um, the Marxist, the yeah. Bavarian inheritance of the country. That's not the concept that interests you, it's the good life. Well, the concept of emancipation, social emancipation, interests me too. But these are two parts that are held together yeah, yeah. in my argument. So social emancipation, of course, is very important. Social domination in that sense. Why the good life? Where is this concept? It's a very good from? question, and it's absolutely crucial for what I'm saying. I can make that link, but probably touched on the most speculative point in, there, in, a, in, a, in a dodgy sense, as opposed to a gay sense. I think of it. I think of it through <laughs> the notion of life as a whole. So in this sense, I'm reading that really through Weber, through the Protestant work ethic, and you know, thinking about the preconditions for capitalism, 
rationalization of inner life, uh, different aspects of life uh, becoming autonomous, uh, economic life disentangled from other stuff. So that, you know, that barbarian reading of modernity is thoroughgoing rationalization of life, uh, which um, you know, then presents the kind of objective social conditions for posing the question of reason as a whole. So but I guess maybe I am moving too quickly there from posing that question of reason as a whole to posing the question of the good life there. But um, it's certainly there. I mean, we threw out the possibility of the reification of life as a whole becomes meaningless, becomes comprehensive in its individual parts. Uh, so as economic agents, as legal agents, etc., we understand ourselves as perspicuous, uh, even though it's characterized by this chasm of causality to freedom. Um, but I, I think it's, it seems to be fair to raise that question of, of life as a whole, uh, totality. And um, you know, so, so I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe I need to just do a little bit more work on that to strengthen that a little bit, or you know, so whether it can be strengthened. I don't want to push the perfectionist stuff too much. I mean, clearly, you know, praxis is not a moral theory, and I, I can't easily assimilate it to what's around in terms of. Know, ethical options, uh, autonomy, uh, Kantian perspectives or Aristotelian perspectives. Um, can, can I just have a, yeah. a, a very brief follow-up? Um, I mean, that was, that was a helpful and interesting answer. But I wonder what you're going to have to do to as a whole in the formulation of life as a whole, which is you yourself suggest is a uh, in this context, it's a place of over from down here, not just the totality, but the social totality. Yeah. Um, and what are you going to have to do with the concept of the good life, which seems to me irredeemably connected to the notion of an individual life? If you're going to try to link it to the idea of life as a whole, which is a radically anti individual concept. Right, it's, okay, put, put the point another way. That was very yeah. abstract. Put the point another way. Um, what falls out, it seems to me, in the, in the invocation of the good life, is precisely the notion of the social. And um, it, it seems to me an inevitable consequence of um, look, not just Marxism. I think this is part of what Bob was on as well, that um, I mean, not just a hard time distinguishing between rationalization and socialization. Mm -hmm. That what rationalization is, is the making fully social of the conditions and realities of individual life. Yeah. And if this is the case, then the notion of the good life is to have to have fun about such a radical redemption that it's hard even to imagine um, that there can be such a thing as um, good life as a whole. That is, as a, as a social. I don't understand when you say that the, 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 you know, the good life is, as I understand it, is an individualist project. I mean, it never has been, has it? I mean, that's really but it's a quality in an individual life. It doesn't depend. Entirely individual facts, but it's a quality of individual life. Well, there are personal virtues and there are social Aristotle. in that sense, aren't there? So, um, that really, really for the communitarian tradition of that sense that raises this question of good life. It's a social ethic, isn't it? Precisely, not a, uh, you know, why should I be moral? I think in that sense, whether it's physical maturity. Categorical imperative and things like that. But I don't understand. I mean, it seems to me that it, 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 
irreducibly social. What is um, the um, As a way of thinking about practical reason. So it's as a form of practical reason uh, to think about what praxis is. And there are certain affinities with Aristotle, right, it seems to me. It's not all dark. I mean, enormous figure, but not in any direct Kantian way. Um, so, to, so the ethic itself is fundamentally social. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking also about the point about rationalisation and socialisation, about Luca having a problem distinguishing between these two. Points, but I, I think I need to think about that a little bit more. I mean, as, as my reading of Lukács is that there's a, the capitalism indeed, it's only the rationalization does indeed socialize the world, and then that's it's, it's recognized in terms of, as a second nature of the natural objects. Um, so it's about redeeming, if you like, that misrecognized sociality reified objects. Um, I need to think more, I think, about who would be worrying me. <laughs> Thank you. We have one more question. Um, I just had a couple of quick comments and Greg's thing and then the question. Um, one, I mean, I'm reminded of you know Nietzsche's comment about um, stop telling me what you're free from and tell me what you're free for. That's sort of like a, a thicker concept of emancipation, which in part is, I think, what Marxism is also trying to think through. Um, might be one way to get at it. And two, I mean, I think it's certainly a theme you can draw out from like the tradition of ethics that the, you know, whether it's in Plato or Aristotle or Kant. I mean, Kant is a great like unless we can believe in the possibility that the human race will progress towards freedom, all of human history, all of my individual life, everything will be worthless. Like the transcendental possibility of humanity as a whole being worth something is the only possibility for me to live as a free individual or as a, a person, really, at all. Um, the question I thought I'd ask was about, uh, you know, since we're in an art school, about aesthetics. Um, and the, there's this great, uh, I, I, Lukács at the end of the, the section on aesthetics and, and the Schiller, etc., he says something like, you know, but. The, the reason sort of he gives in part for the transition from that to Hegel is that to, to say that aesthetic reason would be sort of the, 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 the form that practical reason should take would be to aestheticize all of existence, which is a myth or something like that, um, which would become myth. And, and I wonder how you might relate, you know, I mean, so Lukács obviously thought that his earlier sort of immersion in aesthetics, he thought that the transition of politics was sort of important for realizing something that he was unable to do in aesthetics alone, but that, but that, it, but he also wanted to say that, you know, in some ways, the aestheticization of politics, and what Benjamin calls fascism, but what we could easily think of as, you know, like, protests that if they get media attention, like, that is the goal, really, like, actually social change is not really possible, but, but media attention is something. Um, or the politicization of aesthetics on the other, the aestheticization of politics and the politicization of aesthetics, where the aesthetic object, you know, becomes um, some sort of political tool that, in some ways, I wonder, you know, Lukács might sort of um, provoke the the insufficiency of this siding between these two realms um, in both of those uh, in both of those extremes of how aesthetics and politics are thought about today. Good question. There's a lot in there. Um, I, I, I mean, I think he's talking about Shelley in that passage that you mentioned about um, uh, uh, aesthetization of politics or a new mythology. I think he doesn't mention Shelley by name, but that's, that's what he has in mind in that section. And parallels with Benjamin, uh, um, uh, politicizing aesthetics. Well, of course, you've got a realist aesthetic. Uh, in the blue cash. In embryonic form of the theory of the novel uh, that is, you know, is, is, is developed later. Um, and 
but there's a lot of good stuff actually in, in sort of plugging my the book again. But um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of attempts in this of uh, art, art, art theorists and uh, literary theorists trying to retrieve Lukács' concept of realism. Problematic though it is to understand the political turn it on. So I think people like Sakula, for example, that understands themselves. You know, um, a, a sophisticated realism um, um, that understands itself in Lukashian terms. So, uh, Logie's got an article in here which is talking about uh, Lukash's rethinking of Kafka, for example, in the dreadful essay in which the, the choice, I think, the choice between Kafka and Thomas Mark. Um, um, but he actually changes his mind on Kafka. Uh, Kafka's a realist. He's an irrealist in some sense. But you know, Kafka is, it describes the world as it is, you know, as it is, as we know. It's a profound realist. Um, so I think there's a lot more to be said uh, about this. And, and, and you know, maybe, I mean, I'm not. Holy perspective. I've never had a daughter here for myself, so I tend to think that privilege, you know, what happens to the proletariat, well, the self conscious commodity, the word of art, I don't know, tend to see that's what happens to that standpoint, and then, of course, that's a political impulse. Uh, but around about the 40s, the daughter of all kind of thinking about standpoint, you know, it's the artwork, that's, the, that's where the potential moves to, the political charge moves to the artwork. Um, but I'm not, you know, I think there's, there's, there's more to be said about, about realism. And that's led now by new aesthetic practice, I think, by, by, by um, you know, rethinking the real. Uh, there are lots of examples of this. It's a bit of a the guy that wrote the modern bulb. Some documents on the closing of the Darwin factory in France. Um, they're all consciously realist projects. And whether one can salvage anything from Lukács' aesthetics there, or whether that means Lukács' aesthetics or not, or Lukács' realist theory, I'm not convinced of it. Certainly a, a point for me thinking that game. Sadly, we have to stop there. There might be another one. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Also, there's some platypus reviews for free if anyone wants to grab them and some information about further advice. I'm New York City.